It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 301 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday, the 17th of June, 2018. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hi. And Lucas Randall. Howdy. And before we start, don't forget you can help us make the show by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and supporting us on Patreon. Every little bit helps. We're very grateful to everyone who chips in. Uh, please have a go at that. And on the show today, we'll be talking about dogs that find frogs, platypus poison helping diabetes, the migration of giant spider crabs, and the bees that know nothing. But let's begin with the Borbor frog. It's a critically endangered frog that's only found on the Mount Borbor Plateau here in Victoria, Australia. Sadly, as I said, it's critically endangered and expected to go extinct in the wild in the next five to ten years. But Penny, Zoos Victoria are employing an adorable method to find and study them, aren't they? Yeah, I love a good human interest story or <laughs> canine interest story. Yeah, they're using border collies. So um, these working dogs are working dogs, but they're not herding sheep. They've been trained to sniff out endangered animals. And my first thought was how on, why on earth, how did anyone even think of getting a dog to sniff out a frog? But they didn't start with frogs. The first kind of um, animals that they were trained to detect were koalas and tiger quolls looking for the scat, as well as detecting dead birds and bats. So, I mean, I guess from then on, you're like, well, if this works for these other kinds of animals, why not sniff out these frogs? So as Ed said, these frogs are really, really endangered. They've been hit by the induction, introduction of a deadly fungus and there's probably less than 1,200 in the wild. They're really, really difficult to find though because they live in remote areas. Uh, they live underneath the ground and they only call for five or six weeks a year. <laughs> so <laughs> that's not great. So detecting them is hard on everyone, including the dogs. So the dogs were trained with frogs from the captive um, breeding program. But they smelled the drugs, the, the frogs that were given a reward and so on to associate that frog smell with a reward, just mm -hmm. yep. reasonably standard dog training. Mm -hmm. But what's amazing is they were able to find these frogs in the wild and it apparently takes over 45 minutes to an hour just trekking to arrive to the site. The dogs then had to catch a scent of the frogs, which live in, as I said, burrows, which can be about a metre under the ground. And Whoa. they were able to find the frogs, which is super fantastic because it's hard to hear their calls. Like that's one of the best ways of knowing that a frog is around, hearing its call. The dogs yeah. are actually able to find the actual frogs because when these frogs are released into the wild, they, don't, they may not call for several years. So I never you call, they never write. Yeah, you wouldn't even know that they're um they're there or if they're thriving or if you need to start a new site and reevaluate the program. So this is actually pretty amazing. I mean, scientists or these kinds of programs need data, data, data. Hmm. And releasing some frogs from I'm guessing a kind of difficult breeding program, then waiting five or six years. And then trekking through the snow and to see if you can hear them calling. If you can go each year and get an indication that the, the frogs are there with these dogs, I mean, that's pretty amazing. So, yeah, I really like this story. I like that someone thought of training a dog to detect a frog. I do quite like border collies. I think they're quite nice dogs it helps so, that there are yeah. lots of cute photos in the art oh, doesn't it <laughs> so many cute photos i was like oh maybe i've chosen the wrong career but i really have <laughs> yeah but, uh, yeah when you talk about you know they're a meter underground in a really remote small sort of area and there's not many of them it's like you know how else are you going to find them then you mentioned okay you can listen for their call but then if it's only what every five or six weeks a year or something that they call 
Did you yeah. say? Yeah. It's like, how else are you going to find them? And it's the dogs are a great idea. It sounds like yeah. they're really good at it. Oh, and they're also small and brown, by the way, the frogs. Oh, not the dogs. <laughs> no, no, the frogs. So they're, they're not even like tree frogs which stick out. Like they're just, yeah. So they're, they're on the ground. They're silent. Underground, and they're brown. silent frogs. <laughs> yeah. No, that's not setting up a great sort of series of, uh, of, of things to find them with, is it? Yeah. No, but it sounds like a, a remake of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or something. These ninja <laughs> frogs that are hiding frogs. stealthily. And <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm I'm kind of surprised that frogs have a scent. Like, why do they have a scent? Do they have scent glands or something? Do they have are they a, a pheromone sort of thing? Or like, it's not like they're going to sweat being amphibians. They they kind of maybe they their need to poo be. has a smell. I don't know. I guess just dogs smell better than us. You know, they are better at smelling than us, and they can detect scents that. Yeah, I don't know. I can't even conceive of with my limited human senses. <laughs> I'm just, yeah, I was kind of trying to think, I wonder what the mechanism that makes them smell, whether it's a secrete something or something like that. And are the dogs smelling where they've been or just that they're under the ground? Because that's really impressive. I just typed it into Google, why do frogs smell? Because this is, <laughs> you know, top of the line uh, scientific research that we do here. Right, yeah. Uh, the first hit that comes up is from thefrog.org. And it says olfaction, the sense of smell, in frogs is mainly used as a homing tool or recognising breeding areas, but not often for detecting food. So presumably they do get off scents for mating. Right. Well, they go. didn't think of using other frogs to find the frogs, did they? That one would have been better. <laughs> it's probably harder to train a frog. And they don't get cover as much ground. They have pop a little I think of Looney Tunes, the frog with the, uh, you know, the top hat and the tails and the... <laughs> <laughs> you know the one I'm talking about? I the do. singing I frog. Do. <laughs> well, that's the other reason you don't train them. They're too busy performing and show tunes. Uh, well, sticking to the theme, uh, I guess, of Australian animals, and we've talked before about the growing problem of diabetes around the world. A report last year by the CDC announced that 100 million US adults are now living with diabetes or pre-diabetes. Well, some researchers are now looking to a local Aussie icon for a potential treatment, the odd-looking platypus, specifically platypus venom, right, Lucas? Yeah, this is this is really cool. Um, this this crossed crossed my Twitter feed today and uh, and uh, really piqued my interest. So, in case you're not aware, we've got two monotremes in Australia. We've got the platypus and the echidna. And, and what makes them very strange is that they're they're mammalian in that they produce milk, but they don't have nipples, and they also basically lay eggs, which is kind of weird. I mean, you'd agree, I'm sure. So <laughs> they're kind of like this weird throwback of a, of of, um, uh, of this this sub you know little group in 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 the uh, tree of life. I think there's six other monotremes around the world. I'm not sure what they are, but it, they were sort of mentioned in this story, so I'm curious about that. But I thought it was yeah, five. I think it said there were eight in total, but uh, may, I, I may have misread. But uh, but yeah, that, that's uh, uh, there. There are two really you know interesting ones, and of course the platypus originally was was um, when it was first described by by British uh, biologists and, and naturalists. They they honestly. They took drawings back to the UK and they took um, a species back apparently and it was assumed that it was a hoax because it just looked so <laughs> absurd. It looked like sort of like a badger with a duck bill on it. and So, you know, just very, very strange. But they're really cool. And if you haven't seen platypuses before, we've got them at uh, the main Australian zoos that have, have got platypus habitats and they're just awesome, awesome creatures. Really, really cool. But the males actually have sea spurs on them. That um, during the mating season, the males have got these spurs, and they are able to produce a venom, so they can actually, you know, spike you or other males or whatever with these spurs, and and they're, they're venomous. So they're actually the only venomous um, mammal as well. So they're they're just weird in so many different ways. But it turns out this venom is is very interesting because uh, about ten years ago or so, there was a, a project to to um, to sequence the genome of the platypus, and what they found uh, during that uh, uh, that project was that the platypus 
this venom that the, the male platypus produces is also a part of their digestion. Um, and, and in the story, it describes that they pretty much don't have a stomach as we would think of it. They don't have that process in them. So they have this, this venom that um, uh, is also used as a part of their digestive uh, process, which is really, really interesting. But they also have recently been looking at the ways or the similarity between this, this particular venom or at least specifically a, um, a chemical within the, the venom which is basically a modified version of the of of the hormone, the glucogen like uh, glucogen peptide GLP one, which is which is basically we produce that. You know, humans produce that, and it and it stimulates the release of insulin. So obviously, when it comes to um, diabetes, it's an important it's an important thing in controlling the blood sugar levels. But apparently, the um, the molecule, the, uh, the the version of this that the, the platypus produces sticks around in the body a lot longer in than the human version. So that's why it's particularly interesting to them because you know this GLP1 which is found in lots of animal animals including us it's it's um quite different to other versions of it and the fact that it does stick around for a lot longer means that it could have quite a significant impact on the uh, metabolic control uh and and the production of insulin. So that's that's why it's it's quite interesting in this case. So uh, it seems to be quite early days in this, and, and I'm not expecting any kind of uh, um, you know platypus venom based drug to come out you know any any time soon. But the fact that it 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 does it is it does act very differently and it does stick around gives us some clues potentially to improving the treatments out there. I'm hoping it doesn't then lead to like a lot of these things. Obviously, we we find out what the the actual active ingredient is so to speak and then we can synthesize that i'm hoping we can yeah. go down that track and not go hunting you know hunting for platypuses <laughs> because there's not they're, a lot they're of already around. quite rare yeah yeah there's not a lot around there's actually some that live near me i live up on mount dandenong and there's a there's a platypus um park that's down near belgrave um that uh it's just this you know, nice little park that's been looked after by volunteers and it's a known habitat of some local platypuses platypi I'm oh wow sure. yeah Platypuses. I've never seen them there, but they do tend to, you know, hide. They're, 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 very, they're very sharp. Oh, they're, they're as hard to find as uh, frogs sometimes. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, no, you're right about the synthesizing thing because um, you posted this uh, on your Facebook thing and a friend of ours, Luke Weston, uh, mentioned that Exendin 4, which is already routinely used to treat diabetes, is a peptide from the venom of the Gila monster. And that's Which a is synthesis. a thing, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I looked an eye up, and they are like mini Godzillas. They're freaky, Get scary out. looking lizards. Really? Yeah. <laughs> like 30 to 50 centimeter long little Godzilla things. <laughs> They're so cool. No, I'm going to Google, Google that right now. So, yeah, we. We use a synthetic version of that, which is oh, exactly the same peptide as the natural venom. Yeah, it's very cool. Obviously, as you say, a lot more work needs to be done to fully study that and get it done. But it's such a growing problem, diabetes, that uh, we need every weapon in our arsenal that we can get. So good luck to them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I just think it's, again, it's so cool that we, there's just so much we don't know about the... You know what I mean? And how much are we losing when species become endangered and go extinct or we just, you know, don't don't study them in time? Uh, yeah. it's, you just never know. You never know what, what is out there. That's a really scary thought to have, to look back and go, you know, how many secrets did we lose? From, how many great even medical breakthroughs could we have had if we had studied the dodo better or, the, you know, all the countless species that have gone extinct and lost? Yeah. It's, but I think this, I mean, if you if you recall, the, the, this began with the sequencing of the genome back in 2008 of the platypus. And this, to me, is a very good example of the importance of research for the sake of research. So, you know what I mean? If, we, if we're not, if we're not, we, we don't, it's very difficult to always know what the outcome is of any particular research or study that you're doing. Because if we put that measure against everything where we say, what are the particularly if it's a financial or, or commercial application of this particular finding, then if that's the bar that we hold, which which I think it has been of late, particularly in Australia, which has been very, very worrying, 
then we don't know what we're missing. And and this is why it's so important that we, you know, that we fund scientific research because we, we have no idea what, where it's going to lead us. I agree, but but we fund public uh, scientific research. I mean, corporations will only fund so much unless they see a direct financial reward from it. But when governments get behind things, you can have that blue sky research that may peter out into nothing or it may be the next cure for cancer. So. Absolutely. There's no doubt. And, and this is, you know, public, the public purse is very, very important with this stuff. And this, you know, we've seen in recent years in Australia with the CSIRO, you know, significant cuts over a series of governments into basic research. I mean, most stunningly, you know, some of the climate research, which, you know, mm. It's important at the moment. It's kind of topical. Um, yep. So, look, I don't want to turn this into a bandwagon and, and whatever, but it, it really, you know, it does strike me that these sorts of stories are, you know, the, the causality isn't immediately apparent. You know, we want to sequence the genome of the platypus. Why? Don't know. Ah, you know, because <laughs> it's look cool. What we found. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Completely agree. All right. Now, a paper published in the journal Science this week demonstrates that the honeybee understands the concept of zero. Penny, what's all the buzz about nothing? No, you did hey, not. I did. I had to. I had to. It's like a law, a rule. You have to go there. This is really, really interesting because zero is quite a complex concept and bees are insects which are not normally known for being super, super brainy, although we've done a few articles here on sort of the amazing things that bees can do. So zero as a concept apparently has four stages of understanding it. Stage one is kind of understanding it as it, something being absent. So I've got my plate, but there's no food. Uh, stage two is understanding it as nothing versus something. So it makes it something meaningful. So the light's, light is present or light is not present in a room. Stage three involves understanding that it has a numeric value and that it belongs at the low end of a number line. So you can say, well, what's less than one thing? No things. And stage four is giving it a symbol. So humans didn't even get to stage four of giving it a symbol until I think about um, 600 or something, roughly AD, uh, with an Indian mathematician. But it's, I know, look, and I'm not really into the sort of history and philosophy of maths, but I know that just having that concept of zero is just critical for developing higher mathematics and, and so on. So not a lot of animals have been able to demonstrate um, a concept of zero. Rhesus monkeys, vervet monkeys, one chimpanzee and one parrot have done it. This is the first time it's been seen in an insect. So how did they even find out that bees could have this concept of zero and all the way up to stage three? They taught them, they presented them with kind of uh, plates with numbers, not numerals but um, like numbers of dots or values, and the bees got a reward if they landed on the one with fewer. So every time there was a set like three and four, if it landed on the lowest number, it got its reward. So eventually they learned, they see these things, they need to land on the one with the lowest number and then they'll get a reward. So once it had, once the bee demonstrated that it knew how to do that, it had learned that, then um, this new empty set representing zero was introduced and bees who had learned to choose the lowest one chose that one rather than any other number. So that meant that they understood that that empty set was lower than in number than a set um, containing elements. So they would pick it rather than the one with one, which previously they had been learning would have been the lowest one. So mm -hmm. that's super interesting, like just that bees can do that because I don't know. I mean, like I feel a lot of these things, I'm not convinced I would just do them unless I was taught. You know what I mean? Like mm. anyway, or I guess we that's what we teach our children. It's super interesting in general, but it's also interesting because a bee's brain is a lot simpler than a human's brain in terms of number of neurons and connections and so on. So if we can figure out how bees understand this concept, 
it could have implications for artificial intelligence, understanding our own thoughts and so on. So in a way, I found this study quite difficult to understand. So I hope I've done it justice. But I you really, have. I like these things where you think, how on earth can anyone figure out that a bee understands the concept of zero? <laughs> and then you read and you're like, oh, okay, well, there you go. Now, I think you explained it pretty well because when you went through the stages, they all sounded like the same thing to me. You know, it's there or it's not there. That was pretty much what I got from that. But when you actually talked about the experiment, and yeah, I can guess that I, I understand that you, you get that number order that two is less than three, one is less than two, zero is less than one. And they could have just gone for, well, there are no dots there. So obviously the one with a fewer number of dots, the actual number of dots is mm. one. Mm. if you know what I mean. Yeah, that's less. So that one doesn't count. So they're still, they're putting it on that line in some way, I guess. Yeah. And I full credit to the researchers who are doing this because that just sounds like the most bizarre experiment to be doing. Okay, so we get these bees. We've got, like, train the best. presumably there's a whole room of just that bee or something in. They're not flying around stinging people. I don't know. I think they're in little. Um, <laughs> little boxes, fish tanks. Bee cages, I don't know. <laughs> And you got to wonder how many times have the researchers been bitten or stung. Uh, interesting. Okay. Lucas, giant spider crabs. It sounds like a nasty STIs for spiders, but they're actually crabs that have really long legs like spiders. And every year, thousands of these giant crabs congregate in Melbourne's Port Phillip Bay to shed their hard shells. And that's a pretty amazing sight to see. But it's what happens afterwards that's kind of cool, isn't it? Well, we don't know. <laughs> that's, that's, we know I guess the cool, the cool thing is we don't really know what happens afterwards. Uh, you know, they, they do congregate. They come to, to shed their outer shell, obviously being they don't have a skeleton, so they've got this exoskeleton that they have to dump, uh, just like spiders. So, uh, you know, they, they congregate in groups. It's thought that they congregate in groups, probably because there's sort of safety in numbers side of things but apparently they can also be cannibalistic so safety numbers but mm, you know <laughs> you, you might find yourself on your back with your insides being nibbled by one of your buddies oh wow and that's never a good way to end a weekend um <laughs> <laughs> but um the voice of but, experience there <laughs> 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 Thankfully, no. Um, oh, but, uh, you know, I can imagine that it would be bad. Yeah. But, yeah, it hasn't directly happened to me, I must say. So there was a, a story on ABC, ABC News, which was talking about a, uh, a gentleman named of, uh, Pang Kwong, and, uh, he, who's a long-time diver in Port Phillip Bay, uh, been apparently diving in Port Phillip Bay for over 40 years, so would be quite familiar with the uh, local environment and is quite Quite interested in the uh, in the in the crabs and the, the migrations of the crabs, and he also has a diving partner, uh, a um, marine biologist, uh, Cherie Maris, and the two of them have basically been studying these these uh, these swarms of, of crabs, these spider crabs as they come in. So apparently, they start to migrate into the shallows of Port Phillip Bay, uh, you know, late sort of uh, May. You know, th throughout May, and then they they reached their biggest mass in, in June, and and there were some photos on this on this story that uh, that were just quite stunning. Uh, it's quite obvious that they're fairly close to the surface, so that's that's one of the interesting parts about it because you know they're congregating co quite close to the surface, so there's sufficient light to actually see them. And the, and the story is talking about how on the way out, uh, as they left uh, the the pier at, at Beau Morris, the the diver was basically looking down into the water, just looking for these big dark patches, which were which he knew were the um, the signs of these these congregated crabs. So uh, if you know what you're looking for, obviously you know the water clear enough and they're they're close enough to the surface you can find them. And and apparently this time of the year that they're, they're not they're not all that difficult to find. And it actually reminded me just as a quick segue, um, it reminded me of a story that was told to me by a mate of mine, Harry, who had been he'd got into sort of spear fishing down at Bo Morris and and that area. A number of years ago, and he was particularly uh, specifically after these uh, very quite small uh, fish that you can pretty much just fry up and eat, you know, whole. They're apparently very nice. But um, he was out there late at night, and the, the technique he would use, he'd wear waders and he'd wade out next to a pier or something, and he, you'd have a, a like a torch on a long pole, and the torch would attract these little fish so that you could you could basically just just spear them and then put them into a, a floating 
you know, ring, like inside of a tyre with a, a net in it. So you could just put it in that and you just stay out there for hours just spearing and catching these things. So he was doing that and apparently <laughs> all of a sudden he just started screaming. Uh, people who were fishing from the pier right near where he was were saying, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I kind of was imagining like a Jaws sort of scenario here. It's dark and there's a guy who you've you know been watching for the last hour out there and suddenly he starts screaming and he's screaming, crabs, crabs. <laughs> and basically he was just covered in crabs that were, were biting at his waders. And uh, when he tells the story, oh, it's, it's the funniest thing you can ever imagine, but it would have been pretty, pretty scary. I mean, he was actually weighed down by this mass. So wow. you know, in terms of the numbers of these things, they, you know, obviously there's, there's just huge overwhelming numbers. So again, on, on the website, there's, there's photographs uh, that are so, so clear of these massive crabs, these spider crabs, which I did not know were a thing in Port Phillip Bay. We have an incredible, you know, bay right next to us with this sort of uh, wildlife in it. And also photos of, um, of great big um, stingrays that live in the, mm. the bay that apparently, you know, prey on these things when they're shedding their shells because that, that's when they're very, very vulnerable to, uh, to being predated upon. Um, but what's interesting is we don't know where they go afterwards. We actually don't know whether they leave the bay, they go out through the heads and go out to, to colder waters out in, in Bass Strait. We don't know whether they stay in the bay and maybe just go into deeper areas of the bay and spread out. They spend most of their time apparently just sort of grazing, if you like. You know, they, they move in zigzag patterns across the floor of the, the bay when, when we've um, been up to see them, and they basically just eat, you know, algae and other things that are that are on the floor of the bay, and they clean up. They're kind of like the uh, the scavengers of the of the sea. So they're, they're pretty important in, the, in that regard, but we don't know what happens to them afterwards. And at the moment, they're also under threat. There's these um, starfish that, um, that are an introduced species. Excuse me. And this, uh, this star, starfish species basically um, are able to, to grab these crabs and, and, and kind of latch onto them and just sort of suck them dry. It's like they, they pierce their, uh, their underbellies and, uh, and can sort of suck all the juices out of them. So wow. I get that. I like crab. Vampires. Crab is nice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't generally eat them that way, but that's uh, that's the thing yeah. that happens. So, so yeah, this this really you know stuck out to me because again, I, th- I think you tend to take for granted what's on your doorstep, and you know, I, being living in Melbourne, I've obviously, I've swam in the bay many many times, but I've never I've never gone diving in the bay, and it made me think I'd love to speak to uh, Dr. Kate Norton about this because i know she's done a lot of diving in the bay one of the friends of the show so uh, it'd be really cool to hear if she's uh, she's seen these swarms as well but uh but yeah there's we need you know in order to find this out we need to do some research so that that this is one of the things i've not been able to do so far is put trackers on some of these crabs and see where they go um tag them that sort of thing they they haven't been able to do it because there's not been any funding for research for that but yeah how very cool and the, the sort of the main thrust of this article is about um, Mr. Pang Kwong and his uh, video footage that he and uh, the marine biologists have been able to make. They've actually got all this footage of these yes. crabs in the bay, which is where, as you see, there was the can- you say there was a cannibalistic one where they saw one crab just eating the guts out of another crab. Yes. But also there's this really the bizarre sentence, yeah, about their <laughs> breathing thing. Yeah. One piece of footage showed a male spider crab lifting a female crab above its head as if to claim her as a mating partner. And Mr. Kwong says, the male will have a female and he'll actually grab it by the claw, hold her up in the air and run around and say, mine, mine. <laughs> <laughs> Which then made me think of Rove McManus in, uh, in Nemo. Um, he did the, the uh, voice, I think, of one of the crabs there. But, yeah, I could, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that really bizarre. He said it's really rare to actually see them mating, even though there's so many of them mm. around because the males can only mount once the uh, uh, the female releases eggs. So, so yeah, very, very intriguing. Yeah, and I think that about wraps it up for this edition of Australians, <laughs> <laughs> which has pretty much been a theme of the uh, the show almost. As usual, you can find all the links in the show notes or at scienceontop.com slash 301. And don't forget, you can always help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. But perhaps the best way you can support the show is by telling your friends about us, posting on social media and getting the word out. And of course, thank you, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then.
very easy to see the frog disappearing in the wild uh, in the not too distant future. So it'd be very nice to have a, a stable population in captivity. With the frogs, we're looking at genetic diversity. So if we can find new animals, we can add that to their breeding programs. In the old days, a valley like this would have been full of frogs. We would hear 20 or 30 males calling. If we're lucky, we've heard one. It brings home to us just how close we are to losing another charismatic species like the bobo frog.